right, welcome everyone to the Wednesday of week four. It's uh, oh, snapping down. No, I'll just make the thing here a little bit bigger. Okay, I can hear people connecting to the video stream, so you can all see this. Uh, are we even using the full two hours? Can we ask questions? Yeah, um, please. Um, if you have any questions, just ask them uh, whenever. So, um, last night I was redoing my office because I had to move all my bookshelves out of the way because the cable drop is coming in uh, right behind a bookshelf that's full of books. So I tore everything apart, moved my desks, um, and somehow proceeded to kill my internet router in the meantime. So this is all being streamed over a cell phone connection right now. Um, So the cup of joy, golden joy. All right. Um, yeah, uh, fire away, Vina. So, yeah, uh, you might you might recognize the setup here as my laptop, and you can see I don't know something behind me. Anyways. Okay. So, um, let's see how you guys did on the. Uh, math test. Oh, let's see, not everybody's taken it yet, huh? Mm. Let's see if people have taken it. So I think I set the deadline for a little bit out of after class today, in case any of you had any questions. Quiz. That's an interesting distribution right there. All right, so uh, the first question is how do you multiply a vector times a matrix? And yeah, if you didn't watch yesterday's lecture, um, Avina, you're gonna uh, be very, very confused by this. Um, always on top. Okay. Um, right, so um, Remember the way that you do this is you take the, the vector, you turn it sideways, so it's five, six, seven, one, you multiply it down, and then add across. So it'd be, uh, so the top element here, x, would be five plus 10, because five is five times one, and 10 is 10 times one. And that would be six minus 10, negative four, so on and so forth. I don't wanna do the whole thing for you, but uh, there's only one other number there. Um, so uh, let's see. Then I have to... yeah, you 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 transpose the you transpose the vector. So it's sideways five six seven one, and then you multiply down. You, you multiply five times each element in the column here, six times each one of these, seven times each one of these, one times each one of these. Then you add them across to get the final number. You're gonna get another vector. So this would represent, for example, uh, x is equal to five, y is equal to six, z is equal to seven, and then that's always one. So, um, so imagine there's a point at five, six, seven, out in space somewhere, and you wanna transform it. In this case, it is transforming it. So it's gonna move 10 to the right in the x direction. It's gonna move 10 down in the y direction. And it's gonna move 30 in the z direction. So uh, matrices are kind of one of those important things you need to understand. And then for this one, this transformation matrix here, uh, it's gonna be doing a rotation and a scaling and a translation all at once. And you need to figure out how much it is doing each of those of, yep. and uh, just watch watch the lecture from yesterday. Um, yeah, 
and uh, basically these these three numbers here are the translation and then these three by three numbers here are both tr scaling and rotation so the formula for rotation uh, let's do it like five today This is the this is the uh, equation for rotating it around the z axis. Okay. So you can look at the you can look at the numbers here. And do you know uh, trig, Avina? Do you know trig? No, no. Um, calculator. Um, so theta means the angle, the degrees, the number of degrees you're going to be rotating it. Um, and this is counterclockwise. This is a counterclockwise rotation. Um, so, um, I'm asking how many it's clockwise, so the the negatives are going to switch here. Really, um, so that's going to be negative sine theta and positive sine theta. And so, if you want to if you want to know what what is sine theta, you can just always type in like ninety uh, sine. That's one. Um, I'm going to just tell you it's going to be zero ninety negative ninety or hundred eighty. Those are the the four possibilities because you see how there's no decimals in there right for anything else like if you did like 43 sign you're gonna get some weird decimal so if you get nice even numbers like this it's either a 90 degree rotation one way or the other or a 180 degree rotation so, um, only four possibilities are and then uh, this will normally be a bunch of numbers from 0 to 1 because that's all you can get out of trig from trig get numbers from negative one to positive one right and, um, and then when you scale it you multiply all the numbers in the rotation chunk by um, how much it scales by so I'm not going to tell you what the scaling number is uh, but it, it should be pretty easy to figure out because if the biggest number you can get there is a one then you can probably guess how much it's going to scale by and so then uh, this is the translation part, which is the same thing that we did well here. So that tr that's the translation in X, translation in Y, translation in Z. Okay. And so these three things correspond to the, um, the three basic linear operations we do in video games. Right. So, uh, any questions about your mods or your projects? Connection error. Interesting. Um, I don't technically need to be online, I guess. Although I am online. I don't, I don't know what it's complaining about. Oh, come on. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Um, so when I was moving my um, router around, uh, I discovered the um, router had a really wobbly power connection. So I was sitting there, I would, I would like poke on the wire for you know the, the power adapters coming in. I just poke on it, and the router would turn off. I'm like, ah, oh, that's let's see if I can find you know a place where it's not going to just be bloop bloop bloop. Internet, no internet, you know. 
because it takes like five minutes for the damn Uverse router to log itself in anyway. And uh, yeah, kind of <clears throat> kind of broke. So uh, it's still connected and everything, and power actually comes in, but the error warnings it gives me is uh, um, bad power, I guess. So um, considering I'm beating Comcast today at, I don't know, between one and three. Um, can I just let me not sign in? Like, this is really kind of awkward, isn't it? Unreal. Okay. This is my username and password, I guess, if I can remember it. Hmm. Every other soul, great. Um, hmm. Reduce the quality. How about now? Is this better? If I move the phone around, if that'll help. No. Two bars here. Well, that's better than one bar. No, oh, three bars. Look at this. Fancy. No, nope, back down to two. Yeah, coverage in my house is so terrible. Let's see if I put it right here. Bars. Go on the top of the monitor, maybe. Let me see if I can figure this out. Okay. So I've moved my cell phone around. Hopefully we have. Uh, nope. You lost it again. So much fun not having internet. Wait. It's back. We good? Alright. Cool. So uh, I didn't sign in. Well, whatever. Launch in real engine. I don't need to be signed in. Uh, It's going in and out still. All right, hang on again. Is it all right? Can I? Do you see movement? Okay. So I'm launching Unreal Engine, and uh, yesterday I was playing with the uh, the water plugin. There's something weird going on with it. Um, so I'm, uh, I've got an older version of the world here, and we'll see if uh, we'll see if it'll work on this one. So again, to get water working, you go to plugins and you search for Wata. You must have 4.26 enabled. Um, yesterday in 50B, the uh, student was still on 4.25 as the engine version. Uh, 4.26 is when they introduced the water feature. So you do have to go into the plugins menu like I just did there and hit restart and then it should enable it and what was happening yesterday was that it actually was drawing the the water but it was just really it was really weird and buggy like um, like I put a lake on the on the world and it wouldn't show anything in the preview menu but when I hit run it would be rendering the the waves and stuff so um, yeah, so search for water and then type in, uh, and then it'll pull up two plugins like that, and then enable the two plugins. And 
Um, yeah, I, I've, I've turned the video quality on the stream down for you guys. So, yeah, let me type what I'm going to do. Plugins, uh, search for water, enable the water. So let's find some area where we want to do a water feature. And um, these things use what are called splines, which are um, um, uh, for a while we thought that splines would like take over the world because you can actually do um, nerves and other things like that. Where you actually can do curves in, um, in a video game. Whereas when you use triangles, you have to approximate it. You have to have uh, essentially an infinite number of um, an infinite number of triangles to approximate like a sphere. Right? So um, you can uh, add additional points. I think by alt dragging, you can add additional points to these things. And these control surfaces, you can adjust the tilt and uh, things like that on them to create. Um, we're seeing the pictures. Nerbs, such a cool name, Nerbs. Uh, to create uh, basically curves, kind of going however you want. That's not a spline. Um, nerves, nerves. Yeah. So you can see this. This is a railroad track generator and so they use splines to kind of control um, the route of the train. Um, I wouldn't be too surprised if like Red Dead Redemption or something like that did something along those lines. Uh, here they're probably using splines for the bridge. Um, you can um, have a mesh that follows the, um, a spline that way you have nice curved um, surfaces and things like that that look a little bit more natural than um, just everything being straight, you know. What I mean? So, um, so you, you uh, can basically make any sort of arbitrary curve that you want, and then you can actually generate meshes using the the splines. And um, yeah, like I think there's a demo for this in Unreal, like how you can have roads follow splines and things like that. So, the water plugin. Still compiling the shaders. Uh, the water plugin uses splines as well. So let's go to water up here. Water brush manager, water mesh actor, water body ocean, water body lake, water body exclusion volume. Let's do. do, 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 do. Lake, that seems pretty easy to start with. And the shaders are still. Need to be drawn. Okay, so when you uh, when you pull out any water object for the first time, you're going to see that there's this water mesh actor thing that is um, going to appear. And uh, okay, there is the area of our lake, and you notice that it's not drawing anything. It's also not clipping the landscape, which is weird because it's supposed to. So yeah, I don't know what's going on with this thing. Um, oh, there we go. All right. I just needed to have moved it around a little bit. Okay. So if I hit play, then um, the water system is actually really cool, you know, when it works. And uh, what it does is there's actually just one water um, actor for the entire level. There we go. And um, and so for all of the lakes and oceans and rivers and islands and uh, custom volumes you make, all of them actually share the same actor. And so the actor looks at all these different water volumes and figures out where to put water. And uh, right now it looks quite boring because the shaders haven't uh, come in yet. But it looks like solid ground, yeah. Uh, it is not solid ground. Um, but... Um, 
it, you'll see you'll see waves and things like that appearing on it whenever the shaders finish their uh, their shading process. Um, and what's really cool is that uh, it'll do waves and things like that. But if you have like a, a river that's like coming into a lake, because it's all part of one actor, the actor will actually blend the water flow from the river into the lake. So you have like water coming down like this and it hits the lake and you'll see the actual the water kind of slow down and flow and spread out a little bit into the lake and things like that. It's really cool. It's a it's a really well made thing when it works. So uh, does it react to you being in it? You can. So you can actually add a buoyancy system. Um, so uh, to a mesh. And so if you have anything, uh, um, so if you have like a ship or something like that, uh, let's see, um, let's just pull up a random blueprint while that's still shading. Um, I don't remember where the buoyancy thing is. Buoyancy, buoyancy. Yeah, I don't remember where it is exactly, but you can attach essentially floaties to something, and then the uh, uh, the floaties will push up at that point on it. And so, for example, if you have a model that has like the water wings, like from a kid, you can add a buoyant point here and a buoyant point here, and they'll push up on the on the character while the physics engine is pulling them down. And so, um, if you make like a catamaran which has two buoyant areas. Uh, it'll bob in the water and it reacts to the waves. Uh, okay, everything vanished. Cool. Well, oh. shaders, come on. Here we go. Nothing. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think he just doesn't like. Uh, he just doesn't like my level for some reason. It's working fine last semester. Um, so yeah. So the, uh, the there's a buoyancy system that allows. The, the waves and things like that to interact with. Yeah, look at that. Um, oh, wait, wait. I see water in there. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you buggy. You buggy POS. Uh, the water body lake. It's supposed to, in the preview menu, it's supposed to cut away the, the landscape where the thing interacts and uh, yeah okay well I don't know why it's not doing it um, I, think, I think I might, I might know what's wrong because um, what I had the same issue when I was working on it your landscape might not be set to uh, it's like a certain flag you can have on the landscape gotcha uh, yeah. enable edit layers yes that's it yeah mm -hmm. water nothing I think I I think I ended up having to make a new landscape for it to work and setting enable edit layers like when I created it mm -hmm. that's fantastic okay. the water feature definitely needs some work <laughs> So you can see here is a custom water feature. All right. Um, if I drag out the lake, yeah, it's it's not. Oh, 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 there it is. There it is. Very good. Very nice. Man. That's why I pay you the big bucks. Actually, he's not being paid anything right now. Um, yeah. Okay. Look at that. That's very nice. So uh, yeah, that's cool. Um, and so you can see there's waves, and these are better waves than the shader that I made over here. Uh, this this is a very flat surface, right? Like this is actually flat. If you look at it from the side, there's actually no height on it whatsoever. It simulates it via several different normal maps moving around at different speeds. Uh, this is actually a 3D mesh. So if we were to come into um, wireframe mode, you'll see that there's actually uh, 3D mesh, and the 3D mesh is actually moving around. And so there's a bunch of points on it, and you can um, 
set all sorts of options on this to get like nice nice water this is the water plugin yes this is the water plugin so uh, the enable edit layers um, needs to be enabled for this to work okay so um, yeah this thing is controlled with splines so if we uh, go into splines here let's see select all spline points Um, that are not appearing now. Cool. your place for and why is the spline editor not coming up well let's first of all shrink it between the two branches of the of the road right here and you can see that it's actually deforming the train which is good um, okay so uh, the uh, grass is drying on top of that let's spray paint some layers default layer let's spray paint some default layer over you get rid of those plants and you can see it's actually pushing the land up here a little bit. We can actually mess with that, but I'm going to just move the roads around it a little bit so we don't get grass growing up out of the water body. Okay, that looks fine. Back into select mode. And, uh, okay. So, um, there's a bunch of different uh, types of waves you can put on it, um, well, there's two. There's Gerstner waves and, and the water waves. Gerstner waves actually look pretty pretty damn cool. Um, so you can see that, and then the default one is uh, a little bit milder, I think. So we do Gerstner waves, max wave height offset, uh, max attenuation, water depth, uh, overlap material priority, actor hidden, billboard. Let's see, fall off. So uh, it creates it creates a lip around it. Um, So you can you can turn off the lip and um, things like that. So here curve settings, flip curves. Um, okay. No spline points are selected. Why is it not showing me the splines on this? So the water body lake selected. Normally we'll have three spline points, but they're not appearing now. <sighs> Let's just play this and take a look at it. Looks pretty good. Yeah. 
but there's there's all sorts of there's all sorts of settings you can um, set on it. Number of waves, min, max, min amplitude, max amplitude, direction, steepness. Uh, let's set the minimum to be one thousand. <laughs> and so, like, pretty cool. Um, obviously, it looks pretty weird for a little lake like this, but um, set the minimum up to like. 50 centimeters and the max up to like a meter, then uh, you'll actually get um, more dramatic waves out of it. This is just a little pond, so it should be like pretty, it should be pretty, pretty mellow. So we'll turn those back down. Um, and the number of waves we can turn down as well. Um, And that kind of controls, you know, how many different waves it has simulating inside of it. Uh, yeah, it's good enough. See, so you guys can play with those um, those values there. That well, looks not bad. Looks not bad. And then if you want, you can have a river, and the river can come over here. Start there. Just exploded something. Ah, look at that. I just read it everything. <laughs> uh, still not letting me. So it's modifying the, the landscape in real time. You're supposed to be able to select that. And I don't know. It's doing it yesterday. That's the ending point. There we go. That's so weird. Uh, there we go, and now the splines are appearing. All right, cool. Um, oh, no, no, it's vanished again. See, you can see the, the points on them right there. And so what you can do is you can move each of those individual points around. And I'm not playing, am I? No. Um, so each one of those points can can be moved around, and you can adjust the curve, and you can have it run down a mountain and things like that. Um, Like normally, you just click on the spline point. I don't know. It's like they're clearly there. So yeah, you guys can play with that. Oh, see, you can see the spline points here. See, there's three spline points, and why can I not select them? Okay, so you got some questions on your code. Go, go for it.
Yeah, if you go inside of the if you go inside of the water, then it has a shader that turns on for that. Um, each control point can be scaled and positioned. Yeah, I don't see your question, Avina. Raft simulator. So you got dash to move working in the game before and have to work with the dash is completed. I need to snap back to its original speed instantly. Okay, so you can set it up so that when the um, if you're doing animations, you can set it so that at certain points on the animation it fires an event. And then you, you just have something that says when this event happens, change my speed, that kind of stuff. Uh, let's see, water tool feature. Great new spline points using alt drag. Yeah, it's, see. Yeah, so you can click on the spline points and move them. I don't know what's going on with that? Oh. Pretty fantastic tutorial, huh, guys? <laughs> yeah, see. So Click on it, and then normally, like, three spline points appear. things aren't appearing because they were they were yesterday without doing anything different all right so I'll just build the lighting and call that a day um, all right so let's take a look at it that's how I did it and it doesn't snap back all right let's take a look at your code and okay so we got input action dash input action dash released okay so when you hit it and when you let go of it oh it's gonna do reset do once. Okay. Pawn movement, set speed, spawn movement acceleration, delay 0.04 seconds, um, and then you probably should just hook up input action dash released to this. Maybe. Like when you let go, eh, maybe not. But um, like when you when you release it, it should just immediately reset your speed and acceleration um, and if you don't then the delay should do it Let me try that so just drag from this pin here over into set max speed and set max acceleration and then when they let go of it it'll do it and then you can leave the rest of it as it is because uh, the delay will kick in and it'll uh, it should reset it anyway But um, that, that, that wasn't actually what I was talking about. What I was talking about is that if you have uh, an animation, um, and if you set up an animation blueprint, then um, close out of this. Um, do I not have it on here? Um, I don't. So, animation. Montage, animation blueprint. Um, yeah, sure. Here. So here's our animation, right, for the firing. You can actually add. Um, pause. You can actually add um, events, uh, which are called notifies, and um, you can add notifies at certain points in an animation. So if you create a dash animation. Then it starts playing, and when it reaches a certain point, it can fire a notify off, and then you listen for that, 
and reset the speed when you get to that point. That's that's another way of doing it. But since you're not doing any custom animations, I, it, it doesn't matter. Notifies can also be used for things like footsteps. So um, every so often it fires a notify, your foot just contacted the ground. Um, uh, I like it's a, it's it just like to almost stop in place, but instead it's going back to normal speed. I mean, yeah, that's that's what your thing's doing, right? Like it's um, like your code is giving this huge amount of speed and acceleration, and then you're going back to you know this, right? So what you can do is set the max speed to zero and acceleration to zero or something close to it, and then have another delay node that after a another pause it goes back to regular speed so you dodge it pauses and then you're you're back to normal so that's actually how i did it with my sprinter um code uh, you hit sprint and then for a few seconds you're running at really high speed and then there's a cooldown and during the cooldown um you're running slowly um and then there's another cooldown and then you can use it again so it's like a, a state machine different states you can be in. Okay, so uh, that's the that's the water renderer, which um, yeah, I don't Appearing here, um, you can see them right there. They're just not selectable for some reason, like they were yesterday. Okay, um, uh, it only stops going fast until it hits the solid object. Okay. It doesn't stop prematurely. Yeah, hook up, hook up the uh, dash release to, to it also. Let's see how that see how that goes. Okay, so that's water. Uh, you can you can close the entire world you're in in an um, island. Or not an island, yeah, uh, ocean. Um, so if you do that, then it wraps the whole world in an ocean thing, and uh, you can choose the inner radius and the outer radius. Uh, um, and that's that's kind of a nice uh, that's kind of a nice touch also. So. Rather than having your world just sort of end at the edge of the world like that, you can have it stretch off into infinity with water. So, um, yeah. So islands are used for like a little self-contained bit of land inside of water. Lake is for self-contained water inside of land. Ocean wraps basically the whole world in water. Uh, a river carves out a channel of water and. Um, you have to do things like control the the banks because it'll carve them at like a forty five degree angle, and uh, and things like that. So you have to play with those settings a bit to get it all to work. But what's really cool about it, like I said, is that all of these water elements all interact with each other because all of them share the same. Um, they all share the same uh, water mesh actor, which controls water across the entire the entire map which means uh, water will flow into each other and waves will move from one of the regions into another region and dissipate and stuff like that, which is just a really neat, really neat trick. So, okay. Um, okay, so what else we need to talk about? Uh, let's see, basics, lighting, uh, post-processing volume. Yeah, we can do that, I guess. Um, so there's different volumes you can add to your to your map. A volume is sort of an invisible region, and so a basic um, uh, a basic thing that we'll use a lot in video games is a blocking volume, and a blocking volume is an invisible wall. If you guys have ever played Pokemon, um, right? They have these bushes that stop you from being able to uh, to travel uh, that's it but um, typically we, we don't like having just the world end at a place you can fall off of it looks really awkward and bizarre 
So we can instead drag out a blocking volume. And so blocking volume can be scaled and rotated and moved. And uh, what it is is an invisible wall. So see, it doesn't appear. In, it does not appear in the world at all, right? But it blocks our projection and uh, stops us from moving through it. And so this is very common in video games. And it's super annoying, like when it's not done right, uh, because. Um, like there's a road like this, and you're just like, I just want to, I, I want to walk down the road. It's like, sorry, you can't, and people get mad. So, um, typically, what will happen is, uh, I just deleted it. Um, they'll put like a little fence there or something, like some sort of graphic to be like, you can't walk this way, and you you try jumping over it, and your face just sort of slides on this invisible barrier. And you're like, oh, okay, they put a blocking volume up there. And, and it's not quite so bad. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, sometimes they'll hide them inside of, like, mountains and things like that. So, like, you're, you're, like, climbing up a mountain, and all of a sudden your face just runs into an invisible barrier. Like, and it's supposed to be because, like, oh, it's too steep for you to walk up. But I was just walking up it, and now my face is just, like, pushed up against this invisible barrier. So... Um, it, it can it can be annoying, but it's there for you. So uh, blocking volumes block projectiles and um, um, uh, people and everything. They can't they can't walk through. Um, map check found some issues. Really, uh, wall is in the same location. Oh yeah, this this is the old version that we had. My daughter created multiple duplicates on top of each other. It, um, splines, nope, still not here. Okay. Yep. Show spline points, maybe? Okay. Ah, there they are. Look at that. They're back. So it must have, I must have hidden them somehow, even though I don't remember ever doing that. Uh, yeah, so I went to show use defaults and now the spline points are back. Cool. All right, now I can tell you about splines. That's so weird. I don't know how that got hidden. And they're not even, they're not even like one of the default things, right? It must have been one of these options down here some, somehow that got set. Okay, so when you, uh, when you do that, um, you can uh, create new splines by alt dragging and with the spline tool you can actually create sort of arbitrary shapes right and uh, these things will have these control surfaces on them and if you um, move them around um, You can um, basically yeah you know, make whatever kind of cool little cool little shape you want and uh, okay now that I now that I can do that now we can do a river all right cool put that like yeah let's let's have a river I don't know, running down here or something all right so. Water body river, toss you out there. Okay, so, okay, now the splines are back. All right, neat. So, what I'd like to do is set the endpoint over here. You can see how it's just terraforming my world as it goes along. And I will pull you down to here. And then this point here. I will raise up this way, and you can see the the lip that it creates looks pretty unnatural, right? Like they they try to do an alright job, like they carve away the terrain at like a forty five degree angle, but um, 
it never it never looks quite right. So um, you need to you need to really do you really do need to play with the uh, the settings on it and things like that to get it to to work right. Um, pull it over there. And then we've got the fall off settings um, angle. Set so the fall off angle to be 10 degrees. That chopped off too much of the world, huh? Look at that. Wow. <laughs> okay. Set so the fall off angle to be 90 degrees. There we go. Um, and so that's the angle that it chops the, uh, the train at. That looks kind of bad too. Fall off width. We'll just set that to zero, and then um, you'll see it, it just carves directly into the train with that setting. And then that point, I can lift up a little bit here, and then I can add a bend to the river like that. And if I alt drag like that, I can add another spline point Pull it this way, and so you can have you know sort of a river that just kind of meanders around however you want. This one here. Yeah. Uh, edge offset of zero, so there's no edge on it anymore. Uh, it looks a little weird. Let's put in a little bit of an edge on it. Half a meter. The water's sticking out here. Maybe. It's also a little weird. Yeah, so kind of cool. Pretty neat how it interacts with the landscape. Is it going uphill? It is going uphill, isn't it? Oh, the water's flowing that way, actually. That makes sense. Okay, let's pull this up. Connect it over to the road, maybe. Spline point there. If you zoom in, you can see the water is flowing. I like some sort of you, you can see the lip here. Like I said, playing with those, playing with those options. Eh, it's always tricky to kind of get it looking right. sticking out here. That's fine. Okay, so uh, when we're playing the game, you'll just walk around and you'll see there's a river. Cool. And if you wanted, you could add, like I said, buoyancy uh, act, um, components. And you can maybe spawn blocks that are floating down the river using the buoyancy components. And uh, the physics engine will handle that for you, which is kind of cool. Um, um, okay, so. Depth 512, uh, curve ramp width. Make it a little deeper. Yeah, that looks nice. Okay. Um, the mod side of things is done. I just don't know how to balance the thing correctly. Um, yeah. you're, you're not going to get. You're not going to get dinged on the balance side. Just get it, get it done. Um, yeah, and so now that 
the things working, which I don't know why it wasn't before, uh, you can actually rotate through the different points by using these things here. Select all spline points, select next spline points, and uh, you can go through them and you can add spline points again by holding down Alt and dragging. And so you can create all sorts of, you know, very interesting um, curves and rivers and things like that. Let's see, offset uh, 50, 60. I think it's still a little bit. water plants there. There's still that little lip of water right there. Yeah. Okay. okay. Enough messing with that. So um, yeah, do you guys do you guys kind of understand splines now? So you can use them to create sort of any arbitrary curve in 3D. And you can um, rotate them to get them to bend in different directions. And um, maybe tilt it. <laughs> Have it come up. So. Eh, it's actually kind of a kind of a cool effect, I guess. I don't know. And then you'd want to disguise the uh, the starting point on it, maybe with some uh, flowers or something. I don't know. Oh, the flowers are gone. Neat. Oh, nope, they're there. All right, cool. Um, so let's go into our landscaping and paint some meadow onto this right here. Let's see if we get some plants. Oh, do I have it on road? I do have it on road. Meadow. There we go. Yeah, so usually anytime there's a boundary, you want to do something to kind of soften it up a little bit. All right, so if I play the game now, come over here, you can see it's reflecting the, uh, the mountain. It's kind of cool. It is doing screen space reflections. So you see when I don't see the mountain, it's not reflecting, and then when I see the mountain, it reflects. So screen space reflections are kind of lame, but they're cheap, you know. So then I'll follow the path over here and open world game or whatever it is we're making. I don't know. And then we come over to here, and uh, you can see I've disguised the the edge, the liminality, the the place where the water begins is hidden. By all the plants here, so it doesn't look too bad. We got some aquatic plants, also does not look bad. And then I could follow the the thing down. Uh, these edges are okay. You can see there's a post processing volume. Oh, I died. Um, <laughs> I died because I hit the kill the the kill plane. So uh, that's also something you guys might have seen if you have gone downwards in your map. Um, the world has a kill plane on it. So if we go down to world settings and we have kill Z, it is 10 meters below sea level. So we'll probably set that to like uh, 100 meters down. So if we fall out of the world, we'll have to fall a little bit further, but um, it, won't, it won't kill us easily. Um, <clears throat> Make a raft building simulator. Yeah, there, have, have you seen that? The game called Raft? That uh, you can like construct custom rafts and things like that. Uh, volumetric fogs, not not too bad, not too bad. I'll come over here. You can see the water is beginning here. The foliage obscures the beginning. It comes up a little bit because I, I rotated it up. And that's kind of a that's kind of a neat effect. I don't know. It, it's almost like it's coming up so fast, it's kind of like cresting upwards a little bit, which is kind of cool. 
And then if we come down here, you'll see the post-processing volume will come on. A um, little buggy, of course. Um, and so it changes the camera color while you're underwater. And uh, yeah, so what do you guys think? It's a lot better when the splines appear. <laughs> Do you guys, uh, do you guys like the the water system, or are you too scared of the the bugs to make it work? How did it go? Everything's going fine. I mean, I got like two bars of coverage that we're broadcasting on right now. So, okay, yeah, all right. Oh, does it mean I can't sit here now? Uh, they cannot see you now. Can't figure out how to edit it in a meaningful way. So, yeah, apparently if the splines aren't showing, and I, I, I don't know, it, it must have been, because it was doing it fine on my PC. Uh, I just switched to use defaults, and then the spline points appeared. Um, somewhere, in, somewhere inside of here, there's going to be an option for spline points. Right there. So that must no, it's still there. Weird. I don't know. Um, something must have been turned off somehow. The actual water itself. Um, oh yeah, and so the other the other thing which you know the Unreal help page doesn't uh, mention is uh, well it sort of vaguely mentions it is that you need to click on your landscape and uh, go over to enable um, edit layers and then uh, that will allow the water to carve into the landscape which is pretty cool so um yeah the, the unreal documentation says it supports edit layers and doesn't really say you have to turn that on if you want the if you want the uh, the water to carve into the world like this okay so it's that that option right there so just click on the landscape and then click on enable edit layers and then you don't have to stare baffled like i did okay um it's been a while since I've done this. All right. Uh, all right. So we talked about the blocking volume, right? So blocking volumes can be used to block things. You guys understand that? You can create it. like you've all you know you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like when you have inv invisible walls in a in a game that stops you from escaping a level. A lot of times they'll put like a turnstile, and it's like I can jump over the turnstile, and and there's just like you just slide against it, you know. You guys know what I'm talking about with a blocking volume? Okay. Uh, what other volumes are there? Camera blocking volume. So your your player has a um, your player has a camera attached to it. That's actually this thing here. Um, that's actually what you're looking out of. So. Um, sometimes they will actually attach the camera like uh, far back like it'll it'll actually be like in um, uh, what was the first Mario Mario 3d world or whatever it's called um, the camera is actually like quite far away from the character and so they actually drew it as a Lakitu have you guys ever played this game before like any of the 3d Mario Yeah, this guy. So there's a there's a Lockitu that has a cam this one right here. Yeah, yeah, that one right there. And so it, it literally draws the camera in the world. And so when you rotate around, the camera will and it, and there's a wall. The camera will have to get closer to you because you rotate, and there's a wall. And so rather than the camera flying through the wall, the camera slides forward. And uh, you mean one of the greatest games ever made? No, never heard of it. <laughs> um, and so they actually draw the camera because this was one of the first games that actually had a camera. In it. And so they're like, we'll just put the camera in the world. Make it a cute little Lucky 2. I don't know why the Lucky 2 is helping Mario exactly, but you know, there you go. Normally these are enemies. And uh, 
And so what happens is um, you can attach what's called a spring arm to this. And then when you rotate around the camera, if there's a blocking element, the camera will push forward. And then when you rotate past and it's open, this it'll spring back out. And so um, you can add a, uh, it's called a spring arm like that. And you make it the parent of the first person camera. Uh, let's see, spring arm attached to, yeah, that's fine. Oops. Um, and then you attach the first person camera to the spring arm like that. And then what will happen is, I don't know what will happen with this. I didn't bother to make this any good. Um, yeah, the, well, that's the camera. So um, the body's going to be out like that or something. Um, yeah, there you go. So <laughs> when you like rotate the camera around, the, the camera will kind of come in. See how it like snaps forward. Um, because it's it's like on a giant rubber band kind of thing, and it and it wants to be, it wants to be at the max distance. But if there's a wall or something behind it, it'll come in. And so I do not want to save any changes here. Hmm, okay. Um, so there's something called a camera blocking volume that does that. It allows everything to walk through it. But if you have a camera on a spring arm. When you rotate, the camera blocking volume will stop the camera from popping out through it, which could be really useful if you have like um, an open window, right? And you were and you have like a 20 meter long spring arm, and you rotate. Suddenly, your camera is like outside of the building, and you rotate further, and you're back inside, right? And so what you can do is you can put a camera blocking volume on it, so you'd still allow people to jump out the window if you want, but the camera does not snap outside of the building by default. So <clears throat> that's what a lot of these volumes are used for. They're, um, uh, they're used to create those sort of effects that you don't really think about in a video game until, like, you, until you think about them. You know? Like you're playing the game, you rotate, and all of a sudden you're outside of a skyscraper, and your, your dude's like over here inside of the skyscraper, and then you rotate a little further and you're snapped back inside. It looks really weird. It's really jarring. And so... Um, uh, volumes are um, used for that kind of stuff. So uh, nav meshes we talked about before. Uh, you drag that out, and you can basically just have you, you can just scale it over your entire world if you want. And what it does, it pre-computes which chunks of the world can be accessed by foot by other chunks of the world, and the AI uses that to to navigate around obstacles and, and things like that. Um, there is a more to that and uh, if you go into the content examples for the nav meshes um, you can see how to make um, AI like jump down off a ledge and, and things like that because normally they won't because they're not normally connected um, nav modifier volume um, uh, pain causing volume uh, you can do that to have areas that are fire or acid things like that uh, kill Z volume um, uh, so, you know, if something falls out of the world, you, you kill them. Um, these things are used to um, control visibility. So, um, have you guys ever heard of Yandere Simulator, which is kind of a meme at this point? So, uh, maybe I shouldn't be searching for images on this. Uh, so, Yandere Simulator is uh, one of the worst coded games of all time. Um, they, uh, they leaked some of the source code, and it's just immensely badly written. And uh, the, the, um, the performance is uh, ridiculously bad. And so, one of the problems they have in the game... Uh, they don't have any screenshots of it, um, of the thing in, in action... Uh, is that they'll draw like a thousand uh, school kids all in the same point and um, yeah if else if else if else if else if else if are you okay Mace? yeah no what happened um, you okay um, yeah 
so anyhow, so the um, uh, we talked about LODs before, right? Level of detail. And so what you can do is you can say if something's far away, like don't spend that many triangles drawing it. And um, likewise, culling you can use to say don't draw something. And so what would happen is that there'd be tons of tons of um, school kids running around the map, and even things you could barely see, it was still doing the full AI and full everything on it. And um, and so you can use things like that to uh, improve your your game's performance, uh, audio volume. Physics volume, yeah, we can go into that, I guess. Um, so let's go here and. There's a water leak. There's a water leak? No, no, from my tank. Oh. So, I just made a, a, the pool very, very deep. Okay. Now, if I jump into the pool, I'm going to have a problem, right? And the problem is, is that I don't float. <laughs> right? So, I'm now stuck. And so, what I really want is to be able to swim, right? That makes sense? So, um, what I can do is... Um, Switch case, 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 case. Yeah, the uh, um, um, the yeah the the screenshots of Yandere Simulator is just like a whole bunch of like what help? not to do when coding. Yes, do you need help? Yes. Well, you didn't say help. <laughs> I'll be back in a second. There, I'm back. Um. Yeah, so uh, I just carved a giant deep pit of doom in, in here. So what we can do is we can allow the person to swim. So I can drag out a physics vo volume like this. And I'm just going to have it enclose the... entire pit of doom. This... So basically, when we enter the water, then it's going to switch physics. By default, our physics are walking, and people are leaving the chat. Oh, am I muted? Let's try this now. Can you guys hear me now? Okay. All right. Um, all right, cool. Uh, yeah, so basically, you drag out a, a physics volume and have it encompass the swimming area. And then uh, over here. Uh, character movement, terminal velocity, priority, water volume. Turn water volume on. And then uh, let's see if that does it or if we need to turn on swimming. So basically, there. So you see how we're like falling very slowly. We still aren't kind of going up very much, but you see how like we're not, you see how like it's behaving like we're in water now? Yeah. I can probably climb back out of it, kind of, almost. Can't quite jump. But that's a good first step. There we go. Got out. And so that's pretty easy, right? Like you just kind of cover your whole, um, maybe if I made it even a little bit higher, it might let me swim out of it. Um, it might look a little weird though on the surface. Yeah, see I slowed down on the surface. Right? Okay. Um, come out. Come on, go! Uh, also, the camera should change colors, right? Like that. That should be something. Okay, so there you go. So, pretty easy. Drag out a physics volume. Uh, it doesn't quite cover the whole thing, so let's, 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 let's cover the whole thing. And does it? 
over the bottom. Mm, pretty good. Not quite. So let's make sure that we can't fall out the bottom of it. Okay, so that's pretty good. Okay, then uh, we just check water volume and then it enables water physics. Well, how does that work? Well, on your character, <clears throat> uh, your character, every character, what makes a character a character is two things. It's got a controller, which controls it. Uh, that's your gamepad slash mouse, keyboard mouse slash VR. It doesn't really matter, um, although it does matter. Uh, so there's two things. It has a controller and it has a movement attached to it. And if we double click on you, you can see that there is a character movement attached to it. And uh, that's why the security guard that I made, um, I, I couldn't use the, the nav mesh thing because you, you need a character movement on it for that to work. Um, so if we click on the character movement, we can actually see over here the uh, different stats for, for movement, right? How much gravity do we have? And if we wanted, we could set gravity to like 0.1 and that would be kind of funny. Um, like this, so you can see I'm just sinking to the ground. If I jump, I'm just kind of drifting through the air. I can't move because I don't have any air acceleration. Yep. So, uh, where were you here? So reset to default. Uh, acceleration, braking, um, which mass you have, default land mode, default water movement, right here. So when we enter a physics volume that is marked as water, it switches us from walking mode to swimming mode. So it's already done for you if you use, you know, your standard template kind of stuff. Okay. What was the thing that gives the ripple effects when you splash into the water? Um, you splash into the water, you can do like a particle effect or something like that. Um, I don't know if the water system itself actually interacts with objects that way. I don't think it does. Um, but one thing you want to do is is change the color of the camera when you're underwater, and I'll show you how to do that in a sec. So, uh, you guys still hear me? See me? I have the. I have my cell phone sitting on my base uh, amp back here. Hang on. So, uh, it seems like I get good coverage on top of an amp for some reason. Okay. Um, so, let's see here. Uh, um, Yeah, so we uh, switch movement to swimming when or anything marked as a water volume. Nice. Uh, you can't see the screen very well. Um, you know, the recording will be up later today. Um, I'm, I'm describing what it says anyway. So by default, it, it just works. You create you create a physics volume, you uh, mark it as a water volume, and, and that's it. Like, And then now you're swimming. And it will do default swimming. Now if we scroll down here, you can see that there's different movement modes. There is the walking mode, which is when you're on the ground. There is your jumping slash falling. Uh, and you, you notice that we basically had no control when we were in the air. Well, you can, you can have air movement. Um, a lot of games have that. Uh, Super Mario Brothers, you can jump off a ledge and then you go, oh no, and you can turn around and jump right back where you came from. Um, I think the air, um, I think the air acceleration isn't quite as strong as on the ground. But you can like uh, have fine grain control. You can jump and then sort of have some control in the air to fine tune your landing. And that's actually really important in video games because um, especially in the original Super Mario Brothers, all you had was a jump button, right? And so, um, you, you know, the longer you hold it down, the higher you jump. But, you know, you don't, you, you sort of lack fine grain control. The D-pad is either you're moving to the right or you're not. There's no analog stick on the original uh, Nintendo Entertainment System. And so having air acceleration allows you to fine tune your jumps in midair. And it kind of it kind of feels good too. It's kind of a feel bad when you're like stuck floating in midair, especially with poor gravity like that. Like you're just stuck and you're trying to like move and you can't 
um, it, it, it feels really bad. And so um, I would encourage you guys to think about allowing air movement. Um, and then networking, swimming, here we go. Okay, so swim speed and buoyancy. Um, so if we set buoyancy to like three, <laughs> Then over here, can you screenshot the air movement thing? You can't see it on stream. So if I come in here, you can see like I don't sink in the water at all, <laughs> right? Because I, I am three times. So if I jump in, it just immediately bounces me back out. And that's uh, that's probably a little bit too dramatic. The air movement thing you want to see. Um, so on. So I have first person character selected and then I've got uh, jumping falling right here so I'll screenshot that for you like that so is the is the screen still still blurred for you guys yeah okay um, that's that one to three bars. Let's see if I can move it around and find a better spot. Two bars, one bar. This one disconnected. watch the, the video, I guess, uh, or, or just ask me to screenshot it. It's fine too. So, uh, um, yeah, so right here you have your air control stuff and I would definitely, I definitely play with that. Um, okay. So over here we have swimming. And so with a buoyancy of one, you don't f float or sink. You just are kind of neutral. Um, with three, it flings you up out of the water. And so if you're, if you're in a game where like swimming isn't important, but you don't want to just do like, what was it? Which, which one of the Grand Theft Autos, uh, you die if you touch the water? Is it San Andreas or was it Vice City? Um, it, it's a, it's a little weird and off putting when like you've got like this very cheerful, um, water <laughs> surface here and you touch it. It's like game over, you know, wasted. Right. And so what you can do instead is just give a ton of buoyancy. And so people can't really swim around in it and you can't really, you know, do too much with it, but you know, it, it doesn't get you stuck and you sort of, you sort of fling the player out, you know? And, and so it's still water, but, um, uh, you know, you can see into it and stuff like that. You can swim technically, but you don't really have to put too much time and effort into actually implementing swimming. So, um, uh, you guys understand on that? And so that is the buoyancy option under uh, swimming. Alright. Um, and then there's a flying mode as well. Uh, max fly speed, let's see, buoyancy. Max out of water, step height. Yeah, yeah. Let's make that like a hundred, because it really sucks getting stuck in water, and that's actually um, one of my complaints about Valheim is that um, it's really easy to actually get stuck in water, even if there's like like this, you you literally can't get out of it. So let's jump in, and then by increasing that step out height, you can step out of it a little bit. 
easier. Okay. Because um, it, it, it really sucks when you're in a game and you're just like looking at you're looking at the ground in front of you and there's nothing like blocking you, but you can't physically pull yourself up out of the water. So um, you mess with that as well. Is there a tab somewhere? Uh, so you're clicking on the character movement. So uh, open up your first person character and click on the character movement thing there. And then there is a little arrow right here that is the uh, that expands your options on it. Um, jump out of water and yeah. Okay. So that's a physics volume. Physics volumes are pretty cool. Um, so you just say this area is a swimming pool. Cool. And it just will automatically switch you into that. Um, and everything just kind of works magically. Yay. All right. So then the next thing we want to do is add a post-processing volume so that when we're underwater, it doesn't look like it's a bright, sunny day. It's kind of a weird, kind of a weird thing. And so there's this thing called a post-process volume. Drag that out. And by default, it's a one meter cubed like everything else in Unreal. So uh, same as before, we're going to have this thing um, sort of overlap the water and the physics volume that if we wanted. We could probably copy the um, physics volume, its stats. I'm just going to make it so that and there and down. I don't want this extending above the, I don't want it above the ground because I don't want the camera turning blue when you're outside of the, the water. Okay, so I've got a post-process volume under here now and um, and uh, there's a bunch of options here. The um, You do things like film grain, let's see, where are you, film grain? If you were film grain, where would you be? Uh, Misks, path tracing, translucency, ray tracing reflections, screen space reflections, reflections, motion blur. That might be interesting. Yeah, so there's a lot of special effects you can do with a post processing volume. It's not just for like underwater things. Um, film, okay, slope to shoulder. Let's see what this does. So you mess with the camera settings essentially when you're underwater. going to affect the color under the water. So I'm going to make it I don't know. It's probably too blurry for you guys to see anything, but you can you can do things like um, uh, I'm messing with chromatic aberration there, uh, depth of field. Yeah, 
have it be all blurry if you want. Just play with it until it kind of looks cool. Um, exposure. Yeah, so there's, I don't know, there's just a lot of things you can do to it. And so, anyhow, yeah, so what happens is that you're just in your world, like minding your own business, and you're like, oh, no, I'm going to fall into the water. Ah. When you go under there, you see the sky turns blue. Um, we've got that chromatic aberration effect, which maybe isn't coming through on a one-bar streamed cell phone. But uh, if you watch it on YouTube, it'll probably look kind of cool. It uh, does to me. And everything kind of turns blue a little bit. Uh, we can add film grain to it as well. Somewhere inside of here, let's see, film, uh, let's see, grain, there we go, grain jitter, grain intensity, okay, so, so you can add like a film grain effect, which adds like black speckles to the, uh, to the camera representing, you know, your black oxygen or something like that. So everything looks nice, everything looks nice, everything looks nice. We jump in here and boom, we're now in a post-processing volume, which turns everything blue and adds chromatic aberration and film grain and stuff like that. And then when we pop out, boom, it's back to normal. And we hop in again. Oh, you see it's, it's, it's actually extending a little bit above the surface. So, and it, and it blends nicely between uh, the two, so. Yeah, we need to we need to lower it a little bit, okay, because the uh, post process volume, uh, because it's sticking up a little bit too high. So I'm going to drop this down just a little bit, and then um, this is that basically what makes it feel like it's in water. Yeah, exactly. And so now when I enter the water, perfect. Um, it's a little too purpley though for my for my taste. So let's see if we can make this look a little bit better. Um, bubble depth of field. Let's see. Is that you? You. Chromatic aberration. Let's see here. So let's see. Let's see if we can find a good color for underwater. Maybe just a little bit blue, maybe. Okay. Right. Um, if you play Bethesda games, if you walk in the waterline, you can see the post process clip. Yeah, it's really funny because uh, I'll actually swim right with the camera below the the clipping the the plane for the um, for the water, and it doesn't turn the post processing on. So whenever you're given one of those stupid quests to like find like something at the bottom of a lake, you, you move your camera like a centimeter below the surface of the water and it's just broad daylight, with no fog, nothing. And you just swim around and be like, oh, there's a treasure chest. And then when you go under there, poof, fog and all that stuff. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there you go. It's not too bad. Okay. So, uh, and, and also, and it does a really nice job, like blending between the two things. So it'll, you see how it like kind of, kind of turns on and off smoothly. You got the chromatic aberration in there effect, which is um, different frequencies of light. Oop, there we go. We can see beneath it slightly. Um, it's uh, different frequencies of light bend through glass at different um, rates, and so. So pretty cool, pretty cool effect. You know, not bad for, you know, not having to implement it ourselves. You know what I mean? All right. So um, set. We added a physics volume. We added a chromatic. Uh, we added a post processing volume, where we did film grain and chromatic aberration. We tinted the, the colors to be blue. So that's cool. Um, 
Uh, trigger volumes are used, um, we've used those before, like the box triggers and sphere triggers and things like that. Uh, volumetric clouds. That's interesting. Um, so it's actually not here, but like up at the sky. Do you see that? Choose how high they are. Do we already have one of these? Let's see. Cloud. No, guess not. Alright, so. You can uh, adjust the clouds in the sky. Create some nice looking clouds. It's cool. Of course, the sky is pretty dark now. Clouds are blocking. Uh, the clouds are used per sample. Uh, let's try this one. No. It's blocking. Too much of the sunlight. So I'm just going to get rid of that. Uh, there's a way of having the um, the thing lit, lit properly through it. But... Um, How do people look with their eyes underwater? Um, yeah, actually, I, uh, for you know most of my life, I'd swim with my eyes open underwater. And uh, um, this summer, I, you know, when I was going swimming every other day, like the chlorine just started getting to me. So I finally bit the bullet, got some swim goggles. I think I had some a couple of years ago too. But uh, it's nice not having to have your eyes hurt. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, yeah. in the ocean it's really bad um, because there's so much silt and uh, salt, you know, in the, in the water. Like, it's really rough opening your eyes in the ocean. Okay, so let's do the lighting again. Um, Pain-causing volume. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> opening your eyes and chlorine, the pain-causing volume. Uh, yeah, okay, that's pretty good, I think. Um, so let's see if there's anything else we need to go over here. Geometry. Uh, we talked a little bit about this part over here. Um, visual effects, planar reflections. They have box reflections, right? Right. Um, so like by default, uh, Unreal does um, screen space reflections, and so if you want to have it not be terrible. What you can do is you can um, add in a box reflection, and the box reflection will uh, kind of take a picture of the world in the different directions. And uh, let's see if this is set up right. Well, let's just try running it. See if it see if it'll work. And so what it does is it actually photographs kind of the world. You can think of it that way, in different directions. And then uh, you see how I'm getting. Yeah, yeah, see, maybe. I don't know. No, nope, it's still doing screen space. Let's see here. Uh, reflection compression, brightness, reflection source types, so Q map, reflection compression. Um, yeah, for like reflective surfaces, that's kind of your your way to go. Um, And it, it allows you to have nice, <coughs> yeah, okay. So. It's reflecting something. There's the sun, the sun's coming up off of it, even though the sun's not visible, right? <coughs> so we're still, the landscaping looks like it's still doing screen space reflection, but it is it is reflecting the, the sun, even though the sun's not visible. So let's put a, let's put like an object over there and see if, uh, let's see here. Geometry meshes. Trees. Let's put a tree birch. All right. Here. Here. So it, does it ever occur to you guys just how amazing that is? You just be like, boom, birch tree, and you just drop it there, and like it just works. And it's still doing screen space on that. Um, let's see then. Let's look at the box reflection capture.
it's still there. No. Uh, reflection captures need to be rebuilt. Okay. Uh, build reflection captures. Lighting needs to be rebuilt. Uh, student set of box, more flexible, slightly more costly rendering. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, but yeah, the, the point of it is if you want to have nice looking reflections, then you can add those things and you'll get better quality at the expense of uh, some frame rate. Still cool, I don't have to code it myself. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, this stupid thing. Yeah, the trees in that, that pack have bad UV coordinates. Remember, UV coordinates are used for um, uh, texturing. It's the texture locations. I don't know if it's using it or not. We should probably talk about static visibility too at some point. Let's try that. Yeah, either way. If you want, if you want real reflections, you want to use RTX anyway. Okay. So uh, they do have RTX in. Um, Unreal Engine. Um, it's a little bit buggy, though. Okay, welcome back to the stage of history. All right. Okay, um, but yeah, the fact you can just drag these things out and you know, it's it's really nice. Like you just put together worlds pretty quickly. Um, you know, having the right asset packs obviously speed everything up. So you don't need to do it. Um, it quote unquote works. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, the RTX, the RTX um, rendering crashed a lot for me. Um, I don't know if it's gotten better now. I tried it when it first came out. So, uh, as you can see through this class, uh, there are uh, bugs in Unreal Engine, and there's also times when I make mistakes, like you know, forgetting to turn on uh, enable at landscape layers, right? Like that was kind of on me. Although their documentation should like really just be like check this, you know. Instead, it just says it's it it's, it, it interfaces with landscape layers. Um, um, yeah, so yeah, a lot of uh, there there are bugs, and we had the the things where the thing was turning black, you know, for whatever reason. I don't, still don't know why I was doing that, but it's doing it both on my PC and my laptop. So I don't know. I'm gonna call that one uh, Unreal's bug. Some of the stuff is your fault though, like definitely. That's fine. I don't. I don't pretend to be um, perfect. So, like the <laughs> the grass isn't drawing now. Yeah. There it is, and it's gone. <laughs> okay. Um, it's better in UE five. Docs really need to be improved. Yeah, that's true. I mean, to be fair, like the Unreal Engine documentation is not that bad. Like I've <laughs> definitely worked with worse worse documentation. Okay, um, so let's talk about pre-computed visibility and uh, build only visibility is off. Enabled pre-computed visibility is disabled. All right, so that needs to be set somewhere. We need to set pre-computed visibility settings there. Okay, thank you. And save. Um, yeah, the Unreal people have a pretty good video tutorial series. The trouble is they take forever to go through everything. Like, um, like the animation blueprints thing, it's like broken into like 10 parts, UE4 animation blueprint. Um, and like the official one, it just, you know, like 
we're gonna have a live, a live stream and, and like they're like chatting it's an hour and a half like you don't need an hour and a half to describe um animation blueprints like there's just hi my you know this is my background it's like ah oh, dude seriously uh ryan laley's stuff is pretty good and his videos are much more concise uh, the trouble is like i just want a text file that just has all the steps in it like uh you know enable the water plugin um turn on uh, you know, enable landscape layer, you know, edit, edit landscape layers, um, you know, and that, and that's why when I do my videos, I actually just type the step-by-step -step things up there so you can just uh, follow it because it's really irritating me because like, like there's not, really not that many steps in most cases. Um, okay. So, uh, it's also outdated. Yeah, that's fair as well. Okay. So, uh, right. So pre-compute visibility. So pre is there somebody here? Oh, thank you. Uh, Pre-compute static visibility. So let's talk about that. It's, uh, one of the, uh, um, unless any of you guys have questions about your, we have 25 minutes left. Uh, unless any of you guys have questions about your um, projects and mods and things like that, this is actually pretty important. Pre-compute, but no pre-computed visibility volumes. Pre-computed visibility will not be effective. All right, thank you. So let's do a pre-compute visibility volume. Save and get set. So let's see if this will work. Okay. So, um, uh, where is the entity class in Quake? Cool. Good question. Um, let me explain it to you. Uh, your Xfinity Tech has arrived. Okay. So. Uh, the the entity. Let me just answer your question. Then. The entity class is the only class in the game. There's only there's only a few basic types when you're modding Quake. There's float, which contains all the numbers. We don't have ints even. They work like ints to a certain extent. Uh, they don't have the same inherent error problems with small numbers. Like they'll actually be full numbers to a certain extent. Um, uh, so you have float for numbers, you have vector, which is three numbers, they're held in single quotes and there's three numbers in them, X, Y, and Z. Um, so anytime you're doing with position or velocity or acceleration or angular velocity, it's always going to be a vector. So you got float, you got vector, you've got entity, which holds an actor in the world. Anything that you spawn is going to be an entity. And all an entity is, is a integer because the server has a array. Uh, of all of the different entities in the world. And so when you have an entity class variable in a function, it's just an index into that array. So I am uh, uh, entity number seven. I'm entity number 42. And so that's all an entity is. But when you use the entity type, uh, it has a bunch of member, uh, member um, variables on it. And so every entity has a position, a location, a angular velocity, all this kind of stuff. And uh, it, they're accessed with dot. So you, so for every entity, like self is an entity, and self is always the person who's currently active. And the the server goes through whenever you think, it sets the self global variable to be an entity. And uh, let me let me pause right right there. And you can access them in defs.qc. You'll see like dot float uh, something dot string something. That's how you add things to the entity uh, class. Yep, uh, let me pause. Uh, the tech is here to fix the internet. Okay, be back. So, uh, getting Comcast right now. So he's going to check to see if the, we have an active coax cable. If not, I get to be broadcasting on cell phone the rest of the week. Yay. All right. Ooh, that's nice. Um, okay, so um, so in, in Quake, uh, let me see if I can show you where what I'm talking about so it's not just words downloads quick release extract all. Okay. Um, there's a file called defs.qc and uh, defs.qc holds the, the definition of the entity class every entity in the game is exactly the same if you're a demon if you're a sentry gun if you're a timer if you're a player if you're an ogre if you're a flag, everything's entity class. 
And I, I didn't like that when I started working on it because um, it, it's it's weird, right? Like, like um, the flag, if, you, if you're a flag to like be picked up and stuff like that, there are these member variables on it that hold things like, can I be picked up by the blue team? Can I be picked up by the red team? And it's weird that those same variables would exist on an ogre or on a grenade that you throw or on a rocket that you shoot or on the player because the player doesn't use any of the member variables for the, the flag uses. But the only downside to that is that it just wastes memory. And uh, there's only like a maximum of like uh, three or 400, somewhere on that order of actors in Quake at once. There's a fixed size limit um, on how many actors you can have. And so if you add a float, that float will, uh, when, when, they, when they create the, um, um, I might need to show this guy with more maps. Um, when when you when the engine spawns up, it just allocates memory for every entity in the world times it's like five twelve technically, but a lot of them aren't accessible. Like entity zero is the world and things like that. Um, uh, okay. Um, it just allocates the memory, and so it, it, it you know it's like if you add a float, which is like four bytes times 512 entities, that's 2K of RAM. Okay, whatever. As long as you don't go too overboard, adding 9 million different uh, things to uh, to the entity class, uh, it'll be fine. And, and there are some really nice benefits to that as well. So if we go into source code here, open with the code. Um, uh, when everything's the same class, you don't have to worry about to trust the authors Yes, I trust myself. Thank you. So this is all inside of def stock QC. Okay. And so source for the global bars TC structure. So these are the globals in the world. And uh, and it's, it's a weird kind of system. But basically, there's a global for self. And what happens is that every, every frame, the server goes through all 512 entities in the world and says, like, hey, are you ready to think? You know, because everybody has a next think value. And if the next think value is greater than the current time, then it calls the think function on it. And the functions, by the way, are just an uh, integer as well, really. And it'll call that, it'll call that function. So um, when it calls the, the, whatever their think function is, self is set to, to them. So like, let's say you, you create a grenade, you say in time, time plus three, ne you know, the next think is time plus three, and uh, the think function is grenade explode. And so what happens is that in three seconds, the grenade explode function gets called. That's how it works. And then it'll probably remove itself or whatever. But um, when that function gets called, it will set self to be the grenade. And so you always know who you are because it's just a global variable. And then if there's like five things that all happen during the current frame, each of them, when their think function gets called, self will be set to them. And then um, the grenade has a owner variable that says who owns it. And uh, so like if the grenade kills somebody, then self.owner gets an extra point for killing someone. Uh, other uh, globals are other. Uh, so when you touch something, it calls the touch function on it, okay? And uh, so if you have a rocket and the rocket touches something, it'll call the rocket touch function. And self is the rocket and other is set to the thing that it ran into. And so uh, you could say, you know, if the other dot class name equals player, then, you know, do this. If other is uh, equal to world, double equal to world, then do this. Um, and so it's a very actually elegant system. It actually works quite well because everything's an entity. Um, a lot of um, modern engines use inheritance. And for those of you that have never done computer science, don't worry about it. For those of you that have done computer science, uh, there's a reason actually why I don't use uh, inheritance as often as maybe I should. And the reason is it is when I came out of college, um, I was like all about inheritance. And then I started working with Quake C and I was like, wow, everything's just one class. And the only real downside to it is um, it's wasteful of memory, but it's not that wasteful. 
So um, memory is cheap, you know, and you don't have all these issues with inheritance because like what happens like, uh, you know, demons will have a specific demon functionality on it and, and grenades will have a specific grenade functionality and, and it, it's really awkward to, to work with. Um, with this, everything's an entity and all, everybody has all of the member variables and, and if you want to see what class something is, you say if other dot class name double equals daemon, okay, that's a daemon that I hit. And it's actually really easy to work with. It's actually um, probably easier to write and maintain than using inheritance. And I know that since this is on YouTube, there's going to be some people that are going to be mad at me for saying that, but it's true. The system actually works really well. Uh, the world is um, entity zero. The first entity in that array of 512 entities is the world. And that holds all the map data and things like that. If you ever try damaging the world, it crashes the game because you goofed, right? So uh, you do things like say, if other double equals world. Um, and so like if you impacted the world, like if you hit a wall or something like that, then other will be set to world. And so you can, you can do one thing if you hit the world, you can do another thing if you hit a player, that kind of stuff. So instead of using polymorphism, would it be better in using composition? Yes. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that. There are times when inheritance and, and uh, th there's like different ways you can build classes classes and do your stuff, right? Uh, one way is doing inheritance. So you create like a monster class and you have a subclass called demon. And then maybe you have a subclass of that called flying demon. And what happens is that it, it becomes hard. Like if you have something like this where like you ran into something. And you want to say, if I ran into a flying demon, have it pick me up. If I ran into a regular demon, have it damage me. And if I ran into a monster, uh, don't do anything. Because, you know, monsters have to have, you know. And, um, and in Quake, it's just an if statement. Like, if I ran into a flying demon, if you have multiple flying demons, then you can create a member variable called flying and say if the other thing flies, you know, something like that. Um, and it you know, basically people do inheritance trying to, because they're afraid of if statements. Like that's, that's the, the only conclusion I can come up with. They want the type system to handle if statements for them because they're scared of if statements. So they want, they want to create a function that says if the player, like it takes two parameters, player and flying demon. And so that'll get called if the player hits flying demon. And then you have to make another function for f players and regular demons and another function for players and monsters. So you end up making like 9,000 different functions a lot of which are going to sh re reuse code, which is bad, all because you're afraid of an if statement, right? So, um, yeah. So uh, composition is better than inheritance. And um, th that, that said, there are times where I use inheritance. Like there are times where it makes a lot of sense to me and I use it and it works fine. So it's not like a hard and fast rule, but. Okay, so uh, there is a, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll answer your question in a second, Shami. There is another global called time, and that's the current world time. It starts at zero, and it just goes forward. And it's a float, so it can kind of go forever. Um, uh, it's recommended you reboot your Quake server once every couple months or so. Um, the higher the numbers get, you start getting errors, and uh, like the error will creep up and stuff like that. And frame time is your delta, like it's um, how long it's been since last frame. So that's like these are the big, big important things. Um, and then if you do a trace line, uh, the trace line, uh, actually, uh, the trace line function actually sets globals because it can't return a bunch of different variables because it's C. And so what it does is it, it sets these globals. So like, here's the starting point. Here's the ending point. Here's the thing that we hit. Um, here's how far along the line we got. If you remember that from Unreal Engine, right? Bit time they called it, you know, which is what percentage from zero to one, um, the line went until it hit something. And so that's called trace fraction here. It's the same concept, just slightly different names. That's all. Um, uh, did it hit water? It was it all open. You know, there's, this is like your hit, your, uh, uh, you know, when you break the hit results, it's basically that. Uh, main is the entry point. Uh, you don't really use it. Um, player prethink gets run on every player prior to physics running. 
player post think runs every frame after physics runs. So Shammy, if you want to be swinging on a rope, then uh, you are probably going to want to put your code into either player prethink or player post think. There's probably a, a function called service grapple or something like that. It's probably inside of that already, so you can probably put just modify service grapple. But right now, your code, uh, the, the default code for grapple is you hit a point and it pulls you towards it. So on service grapple, it pulls the player every frame towards it. What you want instead is to use the power of trigonometry to uh, swing. So rather than being pulled this way, you get pulled at a 90 degree angle to it. Um, and so you can use, the, they have sines and cosines and things like that in there. So just sit down with a piece of paper and figure out the math. And so instead of being pulled that way, you're pulled this way. And if you want to know what direction the player is looking, there is something called make vectors. Uh, make vectors, there we go. So it's actually function number one, make vectors. And so that, <clears throat> So if you want to get the forward vector, the right vector, the up vector, uh, you have to call make vectors and uh, you pass in the direction the player is looking. And that will give you a forward, a right, and an up, uh, which are globals also. So again, um, we, don't have, uh, we don't have the ability to return multiple uh, variables. And so they, use, um, so they use globals. So anytime, anytime a function needs to return multiple things, they just set globals on it, and you might be like, this can't be multi-threaded. And you're right, it can't be multi-threaded. But there's only 512 entities, and the uh, server can service all of them very, very quickly. This game was written in 1997. Uh, a modern <laughs> CPU is orders of magnitude faster than what we had back then. Orders of magnitude more RAM, it can handle it. Um, so is there a function in Quake to cross two vectors? Yes, there is. Um, all, like, it, like for the world's first 3D engine, it's surprisingly good. Um, cross product is actually just the multiply. So if you if you just multiply two vectors times each other, it does it does uh, dot product, and then cross product uh, cross product. Let's see here. cross product function. So this is a scalar cross product. It's not the, um, it's not the um, vector cross product. Uh, okay. yeah, that is the scalar cross product, all right. So um, yeah, if you wanna do vector cross product, this class ends at 225. Well, the, the lecture time does. Okay. Um, you need the radius and swing backwards. Yeah. So if you want to make a variable and add it to the uh, global uh, state, so when, in, here in devs.qc, these are all globals. You shouldn't mess with any of these things. Um, that's the end of the system globals. If you if you put anything uh, between the the top and here, it breaks everything. Um, this is the int variables t c structure whatever. So all of these things get added to every entity. And you can see there's a lot of member variables for the entity class. And you cannot modify anything between here and here. Okay. So anything between those things are set by the engine and it expects them in a certain order. And if you modify anything, it will break everything. But everything after that, you can, you can do fine. So down here, you'll see there's just like uh, more globals added. Um, is the game over? Um, uh, team play settings, all these things. You just set them kind of down here a little bit. And just look for where the Team Fortress people put things, and then that's usually a safe place to put it. Um, so anytime you see something like this, it is going to be a global. So there's going to be one variable called team play for the entire server. And that holds the team play settings, which is like, uh, can you, uh, is friendly fire on? Uh, is friendly fire off? Do you reflect friendly fire, which is really funny? You shoot your friend, you take the damage instead. Uh, you set off a debt pack and your friends are in the area, you die, not them. Or you can do both, um, they die and you die. That's funny. Um, uh, I could help you with something after class, yeah. It depends what's going on with the, uh, uh, the thing over here. 
uh, time limit. So there's one, this, this is a global, right? That's of type float. It holds the time limit for the server. This is a member variable. So you see the dot there. So any t the, the, anytime you see a dot like that, what that means is it is adding a member variable to every entity in the world. There's only one class in the entire game called entity, and all of them have a dot map member variable. Is that good code design? Probably not, because <laughs> this is only used for the world, right? <laughs> only the world cares what the map is, only the world cares what the, um, the texture set is, but that's going to be on an ogre. It's going to be on a grenade. It's going to be on a player. Um, like the uh, like the thing says, this sh should be a global, right? Because there's just there's one world. There's no need to make that a member variable. But if you come down here, you can see there's like speed. So you can set the speed of a player by saying self dot speed equals zero. It'll make you come to a stop. Um, Gravity holds uh, how strong the force of gravity is on you, and that's actually used by the uh, game engine to uh, uh, allow per client uh, gravity. There is a gravity set for the entire level, uh, and then each individual person can override that. So there is a grenade in the game called the anti-grav grenade. Where you hit people with it, it turns off gravity for them, and so you can turn off gravity and then you know air fits them into the air or hit them with a rock and they go kind of drifting up into the air. It's actually quite funny. Um, this is stuff that I have added here. Um, so every person has money, uh, which holds your, so if you want to add a variable, I just typed in dot float money. Then every entity in the game has a money on it. Uh, sentry guns have a money thing. It just doesn't use them. Right. So, um, uh, yep. And so if you want to add a variable for like swinging forwards, swinging backwards, it's going to be a float. It's not going to be a Boolean. You got floats, you got vectors, you got strings, and you got entities. That's that's it, you know. Um, so, um, are we done customizing ourselves? That's all stuff I added in here. Um, and then there's a lot of member variables. Uh, you know, if you're invincible, um, when was the last time you played a sound? Time is a float, and so this just holds the last time you played the sound. Like you get shot, it goes wah. Letting people know you're invincible, but it, you don't want to do that every frame. So it records the last time you did it, and if it has been two seconds since the last one, it'll, it'll do it again. Um, that's how much time you have left until invincibility wears off. Same thing for invisibility. Same thing for quad damage. Um, uh, bubbles you've released, uh, like your oxygen. Like there's a lot of these things, and most of them. Uh, are just not used on most of the entities. And it's not like super great class design, but again, it just wastes RAM. And, uh, you know, if you think of each one of these things here as wasting 2K of RAM, like, okay. If we got a thousand of them, that's two whole megabytes of RAM that's wasted. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, you can, you can make arguments that it should be better and, Probably a lot of these things could be stripped out, and but who, like it's two megs. Who cares? Got a th like if we have a thousand of these things, which I don't think we do. All right, I don't think we do. Got like a couple hundred maybe. Um, so you're talking, yeah, a meg. I don't know, some, something like that. Extra. Oh, that looks cool. That looks cool. Um, okay, so uh, so yeah, if you want to add like a boolean. Uh, chamois for like if you're swinging forwards or if you're swinging backwards just add a float in here and uh, called swinging forward swing backwards and you just set it to zero or set it to one treat it like a boolean good to go all right um yeah it's actually really interesting and one of the reasons why i like teaching quake is because it was the first 3d game engine and they actually like if you look at an unreal engine like they're same concepts, you know, trace, tracing lines and um, like in the physics volume, like we could override gravity and um, there's air acceleration and things like that in here as well. That's air finish. There's like an air acceleration somewhere that you can, you can set. I don't know if the engine uses it, but you can set it. Tim Sweeney was a big, big quake nerd. Yeah. 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 Unreal Engine. Um, 
Unreal Tournament was the first real competitor to Quake. So there's Quake and then Quake 2. And around the time Quake 2 came out, then they, then Epic Games came out with uh, Unreal Tournament. Um, maybe it was around the Quake 3 era. So that would, that would kind of make sense, too. Um, and uh, second installment in the Unreal series. Yeah, Unreal was a competitor to uh, Quake 2. Yeah, that would have been around the Quake 2 era. And then a real tournament was 99, which is in the Quake 3 era, I believe. Uh, Quake 3 is around 99. Yeah, 99. And so both of them were like just multiplayer, shoot them up kind of stuff. They didn't really have uh, single player things. Uh, Unreal had a single player game. And it was actually not a bad, not a bad looking game, honestly, for its time. And um, um, yeah, like... Like that's not bad, you know what I mean? Like, for for mid '90s, like like you can see, there's like shading on there. They got you know decent looking architecture. Sure, you can count the triangles, but it's not it's not terrible, you know. It's not it's not horrible. Um, and the engine was Unreal Engine 1.0. <laughs> so. Um, Original author Tim Sweeney, yeah, and and they they made different design decisions and things like that. They had uh, what was it? They had like mutators or something like that. First generation. It's the map editor. It's not bad. It's probably better looking than the Quake editors at the time. Um, Sweeney wrote ninety percent of the code in the engine. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, Uh, colored lighting, yeah, that was, uh, I think the original Quake didn't do colored lighting. I think that was added, um, yeah, it used to 16-bit color, yeah, and volumetric fog, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I like it, it's, yeah, yeah, it's not bad. So, um, um, Oh yeah, the Wheel of Time game. That that was an interesting game too. Like, I don't know if you guys know the Wheel of Time, but uh, the TV series is coming out in a couple months, I think. It's uh, the next Game of Thrones, except it was written before Game of Thrones. Um, yeah. So they they make different game engine decisions, but you know, in terms of, like generations, like they basically do around the same kind of thing. Okay, so it's 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 the point is is like it's actually really interesting to like look at this stuff, and um, the source code for the server and the client are also available, and so you can go through those and just see how behind the scenes things work, and that separation between client and server and then the mod. There's a there's an interface between the server and the mod. The client doesn't mess with the mod at all, so any client connect to any server with a mod, which is really nice, and it just downloads any any asset that it needs. Uh, and the reason why the interface between the server and the mod works is because there is a set of system globals that have to be there in certain orders and certain places. You can't mess with them, but you can add things to it after on, later on, and it just it just works really nicely. So um, the reason why I have you guys doing modding is because um, looking at like an existing product that works will give you a a feel for like the real world right because they're big projects and there's a lot of things in them and also uh it, it gives you a good feeling when you get something done you know in, in a real game and it's also just very educational like it's just you can learn a lot about how games are actually made rather than these little toy things you're doing with like you know making a block flight or whatever you can actually see like how how things are done Open source is for the win, yeah, for sure. And it's it's really sad that the gaming industry has moved away from open source and moved away from modability and things like that. Um, it's really quite a um, decline, in my opinion. Okay, so what will you do with that freedom? That's amazing. Okay, um, so that's it for today. Um, it, uh, Muya, I will hang out for a little bit and help you with your, um, your code. Um, Everybody, uh, uh, 
add to your world some water. I guess that'll be your daily work for today. Add a lake. That's it. Take a screenshot of it. Okay. And uh, it should be pretty easy. You drag it in. Take a screenshot. There you go. Just make sure you enable the edit layers, uh, landscape layers on the landscape, and you should be good. Okay. All right. I will see you guys tomorrow. Keep working on your projects. All right. Peace out, you guys.